Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Port Merion Group PLC investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. And these will be available via your Investor Meet company dashboard. Um, before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll. And as usual, if you could give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand you over to CEO Mike Raybold. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Jake. Um, you have myself, Mike Raybould, Chief Executive, and also Dave Sproston, our Group Finance Director. We're going to cover a few things this morning. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our company, who we are, and what makes us special. We'll then move into a section where we review how we performed in full year 2022. And then we'll move on to our ambition looking forward and group strategy before covering sustainability in a summary. And then, as we just said, there's an opportunity for questions at the end. Okay, so in terms of who we are, Paul Man Group is a collection of six consumer homeware brands with a huge amount of history and heritage. We're globally distributed. At last count, we were selling to around 80 markets around the world. We have two UK factories and also an extensive source op sourcing operation. We sell tableware, home fragrance products, giftware, and hand and body. Our key geographies and key markets are the US, UK, and South Korea, and then footprints across uh, a number of other markets. Turning to our brands on slide five, you can see our six main brands. These brands are incredibly well established in their markets. Our youngest brand is 1980. And then we have brands that go all the way back to 1770 and 1751. So well-known, well-established and well-respected brands in their markets. In terms of our group's investment case, what we think makes Port Marion Group special. Well, first of all, it starts with those well-known, well-established brands which are sold globally around the world. During COVID, we've established a lot of new and different markets. We're now at a place where 75% of our sales are outside of our core home UK market. And we have a significant exposure in the US with 40% of our sales coming in the US. We have heritage and contemporary ranges the heritage ranges provide a significant and important revenue underpin and could give good visibility of future revenue. Two of our heritage ranges alone, Port Marion Botanic Garden and Spode Christmas Tree, account for 40% of the group's sales. Botanic Garden is 50 years old and Spode Christmas Tree is around 90 years old. So both of those two give a good sustainable long-term um, revenue and reliability. We see a significant opportunity over the next three to five years to not only increase our top line sales, and I'm going to talk through our forward strategy for doing that later in the presentation, but also we see a substantial margin improvement opportunity, which together with the sales growth will help transform the profitability of the business. So our vision is to deliver on that opportunity, both long-term revenue and the operating margin target growth. And we're gonna do that by leveraging the brands that I've just gone through with you across that global geography and through all the different routes to market that we have. I thought it'd be interesting to share with you some of our key retail customers around the world. I think this slide really demonstrates the breadth and strength of customer base that we have across the UK, US, South Korea, and then some of the smaller markets that we're in the process of developing further. And in particular now, I'd highlight that customers like John Lewis and Dunelm in the UK, Macy's, 
Bloomingdale's in the US are increasingly omni-channel, physical retail and their own retail.com platforms. And we've very successfully moved from being physical retail to being omni-channel and having a huge online exposure as well. In Korea, Shinzige and Lotte are premium physical retail stores that also have their own dot-com platforms. And Coupang is a significant pure play online platform in Korea. That concludes the first section, which is a bit about the company and our business model. We're now going to talk to the year, full year 2022. I'm going to start off with an overview and then Dave Sproston will take over and talk through some of the details. So in summary, we're very pleased to better report another year of growth, 5% sales growth. And that's against a tough comp 2022 in itself was a record sales year for the growth. And clearly 2022 had tougher economic conditions as well for the consumer. We've really started to benefit from two things that we've been working on over the last two or three years. Firstly, the work we've done to increase our sales market geographical diversification. And secondly, the work we've done to increase our presence on online sales platforms around the world. Both of those have helped mitigate the tougher economic conditions. So sales up five points, profit up 11 points, which means that we have a gain in operating margins, a 60 basis point gain in operating margins to 7.8%. And this is key and important because it's a part of our long-term strategy to get operating margins to around 12.5%, which actually is in line with historic levels in 2015 to 2018. Looking forward for a moment, it's very early days in terms of 2023. We're a couple of months in, but I'm pleased to report that trading has started well and it is in line with forecasts so far this year. And we have good and healthy order books across our key markets. We're excited about the strong pipeline of new product launches that we have lined up for the next year to 18 months. And that together with the momentum and work that we're doing to expand some of our rest of the world geography, we think should mitigate any short term market and consumer conditions. I'm now going to hand over to Dave, who will look at some of the slides on Fulia 2022 in more detail. Thank you, Mike, and good morning to everybody on the call. So I'm just going to take you through the core financial uh, metrics from, from the 2022 financial year. In, in terms of revenue, uh, as Mike has just said, we, we saw 5% year-on-year revenue growth, um, and we think that demonstrates the strong repeat nature uh, of a lot of our revenues, and that now leaves us 19% ahead uh, of pre-COVID levels. We were able to increase operating profit margins by 60 basis points to 7.8%. And that improvement meant that there was a strong drop through of that revenue increase with headline profit before tax increasing by 11% to 8 million. Um, because of that improved trading performance and ongoing confidence, we increased our dividend uh, by 19%. And then finally, we saw a net debt increase due to uh, cost inflation and foreign exchange retranslation uh, in particularly in higher inventory levels. So moving on to balance sheet, we continue to maintain a strong balance sheet and net assets increased by 8% over the prior year. Uh, we did see an increase in, in net debt due to inventory, but we continue to maintain significant headroom within our borrowing facilities. And then in terms of inventory, in the year-on-year -year increase was largely uh, driven by retranslation uh, of sterling to, to dollar, uh, increased container freight rates, uh, and an increase in, in underlying labor and material cost prices. So about two-thirds uh, was covered by, by those items. And then we had a light-for-like -like increase of about one-third in volume terms, although we are targeting normalizing that inventory back to 2021 volume terms by the end of 2023. So moving on to sales by geographical market, 
the, the US is our biggest market, 40% of sales, 3% year on year increase. And we saw a particularly strong uh, Christmas uh, trading period. The, the UK was negatively impacted by weak consumer sentiment uh, due to cost of living pressures and decreased by 14% uh, over the prior year. Our uh, third largest market, South Korea. We continue to expand the number of ranges that we sell into that marketplace and, and open new online distribution routes. And then in, in other markets, we saw further growth uh, in Canada. We, we bought our long-standing joint venture, um, the other half of our joint venture in 2022, uh, 2020 and continue to see positive momentum in that marketplace. And then in other markets, we had strong performance in China and the Far East albeit from a small base, 100% increase year on year. And then in Europe, Russia and the Eastern Europe was negatively impacted by the Ukraine war. And that meant that we saw a decrease in that market. But actually excluding that, that, that region, uh, rest of world markets were up 6% over the prior year. And that meant that we were 81% ahead of pre-COVID levels in 2019. And finally, on, on sales by brand, um, our SPO brand continues to, to, to see positive momentum, 4% increase in sales uh, over the prior year, now 39% ahead of pre-COVID levels, um, strong sell through of, of seasonal uh, product. Uh, and we have an exciting new collaboration with the British interior designer Kit Camp, uh, which launches next month. In the Nambe brand, another strong performance, 13% up year on year, uh, and it's now 17% ahead of its pre-acquisition base uh, in US dollar terms. And we see further opportunities to grow this brand in the US uh, and around the world. And I might will cover this a little bit with a bit of a deeper dive in terms of the home fragrance category, but for the Wax Lyrical brand, uh, we saw a 7% reduction um, home fragrance category was particularly impacted. Uh, it's mainly a UK centric brand, uh, but we actually acquired uh, the AromaWorks brand out of administration in August uh, last year. And that gives us the opportunity to add additional scale to our home fragrance category, particularly in our manufacturing plant. Now I'm going to hand back to Mike for the strategy update. Thank you, Dave. So the next section is going to cover our ambition and forward strategy. I'm going to talk to two particular areas. Firstly, the significant opportunity that we see for top line sales growth over the next five years, and then how we intend to drive up our operating margins. Starting with the sales growth strategy, I've laid out here the four key drivers that we see for our sales growth in the medium term. Firstly, geography. We're expecting to continue to grow our rest of world sales markets over the next few years. We're doing a number of different things here. Firstly, developing new markets in Asia, such as China and Malaysia, but also we expect to leverage our full portfolio of products, ranges and brands across some of the other territories that we already have small footholds in, and that will include countries like Australia, Canada, Scandinavia, and Germany. So geography, increasing our geographical diversification is the first key driver. The second bucket is all about online, further developing our online sales channels, reaching more potential customers more times. This will cover not only our own websites in the UK and the US and building that long-term direct to consumer relationship with the end consumer, but also working and continuing to work with our retail customers who have omni-channel models as well. Thirdly, new product launches. We have a great pipeline of new product lined up for the next couple of years. And really we focus our product development and new product launches in two particular areas. Firstly, how do we extend our successful heritage ranges, ranges like Port Marin Botanic Garden and Spode Christmas Tree? How do we take them into new places? 
how do we extend the ranges as they are into new markets? Secondly, our product development is focused on taking market share in the more contemporary and giftware parts of the market. Together, we expect those two parts of new product launches to help us grow in the next three years. The fourth area and driver of growth is about leveraging our portfolio of products, ranges and brands more effectively. This will include cross-selling within our e-commerce platforms, cross-selling products, driving up basket size, average purchase price. It would include leveraging more of our ranges, more of our products across our existing customers. If we have a customer or distributor that's taking in one brand or one range, how do we get them to take more of our portfolio of products? So all four of these drivers are about bringing more customers into our brands. If I turn to look at progress we've made in the last 12 months on some of these key buckets of growth, then on slide 17, I've put some charts down. The first chart I'd like to talk to is the top left chart, which shows the progress that we're making on rest of world sales markets. We've got a really good trajectory of growth. It's a small part of our business at the moment, accounting for around about 10%, but we expect that trajectory of growth to continue both through new markets like China and Malaysia, but also from further establishing and working with existing distributors in some of the other countries that we operate in around the world. So that's rest of world sales. On the top right hand side, you can see the ongoing progress we're making with online sales channel penetration in our US and UK markets. We started on this journey back in 2019, pre-COVID with around 30% of our sales in these markets going through online channels, whether that be retailer online channels or our own websites. We've now reached 51% in 2022. And critically, I would highlight that as physical retail reopened in the last year, in the last 12 months, we managed to retain that growth, that online growth that we've had despite that physical retail reopening. On the bottom of this slide, you can see both our non-base sales and spoke sales, two of our brands. And again, the increasing footprint we're getting from both of those brands. We think those two brands in particular will continue to drive us, to drive growth and drive the group's growth in the next three to five years. Spode has been highlighted as an area of focus and we have a lot of new product launches coming in as well as the very, very well-performing Spode Christmas tree range that already exists. And non-bay, we expect to continue to grow both in the US, but also to get traction in new markets outside of the US as well. So that is our sales forward strategy and the areas that we're focused on as a management team. Turning now to the significant operating margin growth opportunity, we've set a medium term target, uh, by which we mean 2024, of getting to 10% and a longer term target of getting back to historical highs of around 12.5%. 12.5% would be a roughly 60% uplift on where we are today. Again, a number of areas that we're focused on here. First area is getting productivity gains in our Stoke Ceramic Factory through the automation capital projects that we've been putting in the last couple of years. We're just over halfway through a four-year accelerated program of investment, We're making good progress. And across the four years, this area could generate around about 1.5% improvement in the group's operating margins. The second key driver is about leveraging the fixed cost base, the OPEX cost base that we have as we grow our top line. We'll be able to utilize the capacity and spare capacity that we have in our to UK factories, leverage the operating costs we already have around the world in terms of warehouses and sales teams more effectively. Again, this area over the next three to five years could be worth one and a half to 2% of operating margin accretion. Thirdly and finally in this area, we're looking to improve the profitability of our home frames division, the Wax Lyrical Company. This part of our business has been most impacted by the disruption from COVID. It's very UK centric and very physical 
retail centric. A lot of its customer base was forced to close during COVID and it's taken some time to come back to life. And also home fragrance is a product category that typically is either impulse in terms of nature of purchase and or people want to smell it before purchasing it. So it hasn't translated to online in the way that other parts of our business have. That said, we're targeting new areas of business uh, and looking to leverage our existing ranges more effectively across our global sales teams around the world. Furthermore, in the second part of 2022, we acquired a brand called Aroma Works London out of administration. I'll talk a little bit more about that acquisition shortly, but those orders uh, and sales now will be part of this division and should add three to maybe four million to the top line of this business in 2023. This part of our operating uh, operating margin strategy should add a further one and a half percent over the next five years. Again, in terms of progress on our operating margin growth strategy on slide 19 on the top chart, you can see in the last couple of years that we've delivered increases in operating margin. We expect that to continue through 2020, 2024 and 2025. As I said, our historical levels peaked at around 12.5%, and we believe we can get back there in the long term. In terms of our home frames division, we did improve profitability in 2022 by around half a million pounds, but clearly there's still a lot of work still to do in that part of our business. On slide 20, I want to talk a little bit more about the bolt-on acquisition of Aroma Works London. In August last year, we bought the brand and certain limited assets from the administrators. The brand itself is in the health and well-being space using 100% natural ingredients, natural essential oils. The product includes home fragrance, so candles and rediffusers, bath and body products like soaps, and also a small amount of skincare. The rationale for the acquisition really was to provide a bolt on and add scale to our existing UK factory. I'm pleased to say the integration plan, the acquisition plan is on track. The Aroma Works factory was closed in December last year. All production now has been absorbed into our existing wax lyrical factory with no extra headcount. We're targeting around three to four million in the first year of sales. And this will add 25 to 30% to the revenues of our home fragrance division, Wax Lyrical. So with minimal on cost, being able to absorb that business, uh, we expect this to help improve the profitability of our division starting in 2023. Although the brand and its business were disrupted as it was going through the painful process of administration and there was some shortages and, and disruption to supply and customers, I'm pleased that our commercial teams have managed to retain all of the major customers that the brand had, and they include Waitrose, Holland and Barrett, and some small online presence in Macy's in the US and Space MK. So overall, this acquisition is a small bolt-on, represents a good opportunity to leverage a new customer base, and also provides some extra scale uh, with no extra headcount going through our factory. I'm going to turn next to give an update on ESG and in particular our credentials around sustainability. We have and have had a good track record on all of these areas for many, many years. We continued in the last 12 months to look for and invest in projects in our factories that reduce energy consumption, reduce our carbon emissions. We continue to have zero waste to landfill in our stoke factory. We continue to use a wind turbine to power over 50% of the energy for our home fragrance factory. And a key KPI for the group is our carbon emissions per ton of saleable product. And in our stoke factory, I'm pleased to report a further 10% reduction in our carbon emissions per ton in 2022. And that is now a 20% reduction over two years. Importantly, in the next couple of months, we're going to be launching a new, exciting 
ambition document in terms of our role and, and just for sustainability. We're going to launch a pathway to get to carbon net zero. Our business is excited about it. Our management team is excited about it. And we look forward to sharing that with the wider world in the next couple of months. Similarly, in terms of our people and our communities, we continue to be committed to working with all of our people around the world, the communities that they operate in and supporting them in every way that we can. We hold investor and people platinum accreditation in the UK and similar, similar schemes in the US as well. I'd like to pull all that, that we've covered so far together in terms of a summary for 2022. We saw sales growth and profit growth despite much tougher macro tough economic conditions. Our operating margins grew by 60 basis points and we were able to cover off the very significant input cost inflation through pricing and other improvements in productivity. Key part of our long-term strategy is to take that operating margin up to 10% and then hopefully 12.5% in the long term. In the last 12 months, we've continued to benefit from the work that we've done in recent years to do two things. Firstly, to diversify our sales market geography, and that includes now having 75% of sales outside of the UK. And secondly, to make significant gains in terms of online channel penetration being available on more online platforms around the world. We see an opportunity to grow the top line and our operating margins, and this will be transformational to our profitability. In terms of looking forward, we've got a strong pipeline of new product launches, and that together with the momentum that we see in our rest of the world sales geography, we think should help to mitigate short-term market conditions and pressure on the consumer. Our 2023 trading, we're pleased to say, started in line with forecasts, and we have good and healthy order books for our key markets around the world. And so as a management team, we're confident about the short, medium, and long-term prospects for the group. We have a clear ambition, and we're looking forward to delivering on the opportunity therein. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that has been useful. We're now at a stage where I'm going to hand back to Jake and he's going to ask you uh, to register any questions you've got and we'll cover those off. Perfect. Mike, uh, David, thank you very much indeed uh, for your presentation this morning. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab that's situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while the team take a few moments to review those questions that were submitted already, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Um, David, Mike, we did receive a number of pre-submitted questions ahead of today's event. And as you can see in the Q&A tab, we've also received a number of questions throughout your presentation today as well. Mm -hmm. So firstly, thank you to all of those on the call for taking the time to submit their questions. And Mike, David, if I could just hand back to you to respond to those questions where it's appropriate to do so, and then I'll pick up from you at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll cover off as many of these questions as, as we can. There were some pre-submitted ones, but please feel free to add further questions as we talk through. I'm gonna start with um, South Korea, question about South Korea, do we see future growth? I think we do see future growth in the long term. Uh, I think we shouldn't expect growth in 2023 in the way that we had it in 2022. Uh, the growth in 2022 came from both new ranges that we introduced, which we need to give time to settle down and hopefully get traction, but also as uh, expanding our online sales. However, in the long term in Korea, we're looking at special, specialized local product development, local market product development for our Botanic Garden brand, as well as how we establish more contemporary ranges. The next question is about operating margins. Uh, what our target is, have we changed it? No, our, our operating margin target remains around 12.5% in the long term. Uh, obviously, we refine that year to year, um, but 12.5% is where is where we're targeting. 
The next question is around the rough, roughly £1 million of restructuring costs and what was it spent on. So, Dave, I'll let you pick that one up. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, we, we have moved to effectively a global, uh, a, a sort of more global structure. So there's been an alignment of, of, of sales and product development and, and, and marketing um, that, that um, so why is it not, not normal course of business? It's non-recurring in nature. So, so that was a, a one-off nature that we, um, we've undertaken that restructuring. Thank you, Dave. And I, do you want to pick the next couple oh, of questions up as well on, on um, pension contribution and bank Yeah, debt. so expected cash contribution in, in pen, for the pension, um, we expect it to continue at, at 900,000. Um, in terms of the, the sort of de-risking, um, de-risking of the scheme, you, you would move some of your, how would you de-risk it? You'd move some of your assets to be more matching to the liabilities. So at the moment, there's a broadly 50-50 split, equities and bonds and, and liability driven investments, you, you would you would rebalance that more to reduce your equities and move more into bonds so that there's a natural alignment. Uh, in terms of why we're still contributing when we're in accounting surplus, uh, unfortunately, the actuarial world would assess the pension with a with a more cautious set of assumptions to the accounting one, that therefore the contributions are set on a different basis um, than, than what we disclose in the accounts. And then in terms of the next question, which is level of bank debt, do we feel is comfortable? I think I think the, the, the challenge that we have around bank debt is we do have a working capital swing. So we don't have a sort of even bank debt level. We, we do have a building working capital in the third quarter. So we always need to make sure we maintain an adequate amount of headroom as we go through the year. We always attempt to demonstrate that we've got at least 10 million pounds within our borrowing facilities. And at the end of the year, we had 17.4 million. So we believe we've got more than adequate headroom um, to ensure that we retain, sort of maintain that buffer level um, should any shocks such as COVID, um, or, or, or the COVID one arise. Thank you, Dave. Um, the next question was around energy prices. Uh, if we bought energy at a current spot level instead of being hedged on a long-term contract, what would the impact on operating margins be? I guess it would be around one and a half percent. That said, historically, we've always had long term contracts in place as part of our strategy. It would be very rare for us to buy at spot level. Um, the next question is around the synergies that were achieved from the Aroma Works acquisition. Was the factory sold? Well, no, the factory wasn't sold. We, we entered, when we bought the brand from administration, we entered into a license to operate within their factory for a few months while we figured out how to lift and shift it and understand more about the products. So that factory um, has, has closed and everything now is being made from this year in, in the Wax Lyrical factory. In terms of synergies, well, there are two synergies. The first synergy is the opportunity to bring that product and make it in our existing factory with no extra infrastructure or resource. Uh, and the second synergy is across commercial customers. So an AromaWorks customer comes to visit us and we will try and um, try and sell wax lyrical product and a wax lyrical customer will now try and sell our own works products. Next question is around whether we would consider doing share buybacks. I think the answer at the moment is that we can see a good use of cash within our business, in particular in investing in our factories for the future. Um, so not, not, not the present time. The next question is how many years will our new automation equipment last until they need to be replaced? Well, that really would depend upon the piece of equipment. You know, it's quite common in our industry to have machines that can work for 20 or 30 years. In fact, we still have machines working in our factory that were, were bought 20 or 30 years ago. The new equipment we bought is top end automation and, you know, should certainly have a life of 10 to 20 years, I would have thought. Uh, Dave, a question for you around interest rates and the interest rate, what interest rate is paid on borrowing? Yeah, we, we, we do have a, an interest rate cap uh, in place on, on some of the borrowing. So we're not we're not we're not totally exposed to rising interest rates, but it's it's about 
Um, it's about 4%, we think, at the moment, is the, the average interest rate that we will be paying, uh, having the benefit of that, of that cap on some of the borrowing. Okay, thank you. The question here is about operating margins. Um, is a long-term target at 12.5% realistic given high inflation costs? Well, the answer to that really is that there's going to be temporary, we see there's going to be temporary input cost inflation and permanent input cost inflation. So the increases that have gone through in terms of labor rates are likely to be permanent. However, in the medium term, we think they will be covered by price rise that we've put through on our own product. The very extreme rises in energy costs and global container freight costs, which have gone up by many, many multiples, we think will be transit more transitory in nature and eventually will return to more normal levels. And therefore, we do think that our long-term operating margin target of 12.5% is still realistic. The next question is around energy price hedging. Um, what are our views? Are we looking at hedges beyond fully the 24? We're not looking to contract on energy at the moment, but between now and April 2024, which is when our current contracts end, we, we will look for the best time to go into the market and secure some certainty on price. The next question is on the measures that we've laid out to return margins to 12 and a half, which is the most critical. Well, I think I kind of answered that and said that each of them had a, a role to play. Um, and so hopefully that was clear. Next question is what went, what didn't go so well in the past period? Where do you want to improve in, in FY23 and how will we do it? Well, I think it's clear from the slides in particular that Dave went through that the market that was most challenging for us to operate in was in, was the UK, probably no surprises there. And so we you know we're keen to see the UK market stabilized. We're not baking in in our forecasts, um, much, much improvement in the UK in 2023. But hopefully by 2024, uh, that market will have improved in terms of the consumer and their consumer spending. There's a question around e-commerce update. Um, can you tell about MWS? I'm not sure what that means, but we did cover online and e-commerce and some of our slides. Uh, we're committed to growing and investing in our own websites but also working with retail partners uh, for their uh, omnichannel websites as well. There's a question here from someone who's obviously familiar with the industry, who's asking about our Holloware glaze dipping setup. Have we delivered it and is it in full production? We have uh, that piece of automation is about a year in the making and should start to go in, in quarter two of this year. It then normally takes a few months for these sort of things to settle down and to get the full benefit, but I'm excited that that will be going in in the next quarter. Similarly, there's a question on uh, other machinery in our factory uh, and the status of the investments. So the multi-print machine is in, the uh, clay pug machines are in. I've just said that the glazed dipping line is going in later this year, and we're looking at further research and development and automation for 2024. The next question is on wax lyrical sales. Uh, better second half than first half. What made the improvement? I think that we had some uh, product, new product that went outside of the UK to new markets in the second half of 2022 and a, a reasonable Christmas, given that the market was pretty tough in the UK. The question about turning around Wax Lyrical, I think I've already covered that. Uh, rest of the world sales as a driver. Uh, we've had a good Good growth and we're on a good trajectory in that area. Um, I think we grew six to eight percent, excluding Russia, in 2022. 
and are up about 80% on a wide, three wide basis. We think that kind of CAGA trajectory will continue. I laid out some of the countries that we've gone into in the last, last kind of year to 18 months uh, and, and our strategy for improving those sales further. There's a question around um, stock in the trade and whether uh, retail customers are going to return to more normal. I, th I think that inventory levels have largely normalized already. Certainly that's what we're seeing and hearing from our, from our retail customers. There's a question on working capital. Yeah, um, so working capital. You want to pick that up, Dave? Yeah, I, th I think we... Uh, I mean, we were still, I guess, at the half year, we were still building building inventory. So our inventory levels have peaked higher than, than and then declined back to the, the, the end of year. Um, so I think in terms of what what is that build, as we covered on the slides, about two thirds of that is down to it is down to foreign exchange and inflation and about a third is volume. And the volume really was due to to building building inventory to to. Um, uh, sort of uh, give us a buffer from from supply chain disruption. Um, I, I think it's just going forward. I think it's well controlled, and we've got. It's just about bringing that back into balance by the end of twenty twenty three. Thank you, Dave. I think the next question uh... Uh, is: there inventory? Um, no, I think it's the, the, the increase is largely driven by um, driven by core ranges. Um, in the UK and the, and the US that, 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 are, that, are, that are saleable. So it's about rebalancing and, and um, either producing less or, or, um, or, or buying less from suppliers. Thank you. Uh, there's a question about what percentage of stock can be attributed to our home frames division by lyrical. Uh, well, that's a, as a factory that contains raw materials, the stock level would be, I think, somewhere around 16% of our total inventory. There's a question about what proportion of our products do we make internally in our own factories versus externally, and has really changed that. No, it's pretty flat year on year. We make around 40, low 40% of what we sell. Um, particularly, we make Port Marion and Spode products and Wax Lyrical and our Remworks products, whereas Nombay, um, Royal Worcester and Pimpernel are, are made externally. There's a question mark about changes in some of our shareholders and their stakes during the year. Do I know the reasons for those? I, I don't, look, we don't get to hear about why investors either sell shares or buy shares. We've had both funds take bigger positions in the year and funds reduce positions, and that's really a part of their strategy. Um, okay. Energy hedge expires in quarter one twenty four. I think we've covered that already yeah. how are we managing high energy costs will it impact future profitability well you know it'll depend on where energy costs are in just over a year's time but we're we're focused on also taking energy out of our processes out of our factories out of our operations as well and i think that whilst energy costs in likely in all likely will have a market rate above our fixed price um There'll be a lot of other costs that are going the other way that we should help to mitigate that. I've talked about online already, so thank you for that question. Should ex the question about exceptional items and whether they will continue indefinitely? Well, exceptional items are um, ad hoc and exceptional in nature. They're so very hard to forecast, but uh, I think we've completed the restructuring that led to the exceptional um, charges in 2022. There's a question around South Korea and its strength, and are there any uh, potential issues with, with customers reshipping product to that market? I think we've got a, a great deal more control, visibility of, of all the things that go on in our South Korean market. Um, I was over in South Korea a couple of weeks ago with some of my team, and we did a lot of store visits, met with a lot of customers. Uh, I think the market is in a, in a pretty good place. A large proportion of the Korean volume, there's a question about what proportion it is botanic garden. A large proportion of Korean volume is botanical garden. But we're also now looking to establish further range depth, more contemporary ranges as well, 
given the strong brand awareness that Port Marion has in that market. Have you considered contract manufacturing to utilize spare factory capacity? No, not for our tableware factory. And yes, we do do some contract manufacturing or own label product in our home fragrance factory and we'll continue to do that going forward. What spare capacity is a question do we have in our factories? Well, we have a significant amount of spare capacity in our home fragrance factory. We could probably double output with a limited amount of extra labor or shifts going on in terms of infrastructure. Less so in our Stoke factory, but certainly we could grow by 25, 30%, I think, with limited extra heads and still be able to make that within the overall infrastructure of the factory. What plans do we have to drive uh, or, or revitalize declining UK sales? Well, part of that will be uh, product launches that aim to take share in, in different parts of the market. Part of it will be, again, deepening our online presence and part of it will be, be marketing. How do I explain the drop in share price? Well, I, I think you're referring to the, the price of our shares that was around seven pounds just before the Ukraine war and then and dropped like a lot of the market. Look, we don't set the share price. Unfortunately, a huge amount of the AIM stock market has suffered since the Ukraine war, our job is to, to deliver on what we can control. And I've laid out our strategy to do that. And hopefully, you know, at some point markets will normalize and, and the share price uh, will reflect the work that we've done with the business. The question about the impact of FX on profits and whether a stronger pound would impact profits. We actually have a pretty natural hedge on FX. So a weaker pound actually grows our top line, but doesn't change our bottom line really materially at all. And a stronger pound would reduce our top line, but not really impact our profits. There's a question around the Port Marion Sophie Conran contemporary range. How's it performing? Over the last three to five years, that range has continued to perform well, and we expect it to perform well going forward. It's one of the ranges that sells in the US, in Canada, in the UK, in Australia, sells very well around the world. And we're also looking to see whether we can establish it in South Korea. There's a question about automation opportunities. What proportion of them will be completed in the current four-year program? Well, that's a good question. I think that in terms of what we know and can see, and we've been working with an automation company, the same automation company for two years now, we think that their, their program would be complete through the end of 2024. Um, and I think we're on track to do that. But if we come across other opportunities or we get to see other things that we can do, then obviously we will continue to invest so long as there's a good payback. Normally the payback on our projects average around three years, which is a pretty good payback on factory capital investments. So, so long as there's a good payback, we would continue to invest in our business. And the final question that I've got is what are our plans for the now unnecessary factory site? I think that refers to the Aroma Works factory that, that came with the acquisition. Well, we never owned that site. We just agreed a license with the administrators to operate it for a few months until we could move it. So we don't have any plans for that. It's not our site. I think that completes all of the questions. I'd like to thank everybody that submitted a question and I hope that we got to them all and that the answers made sense. Similarly, at this stage, I'd like to thank everyone again for joining and dialing in this morning. Uh, we've enjoyed this. We really like this platform. It's a great way to, to reach a lot of people and, and I hope it's been useful. Um, we look forward to seeing you next time we do this at our half year. Thank you. Mike. Thank you.
Mike, David, that's great. And thank you very much indeed for being so generous of your time there and addressing all of those questions that came in from investors today. Um, Mike, I was just going to ask you for a few closing comments, but I think you just well delivered those, sir. So if I may, what I'll do is I'll now look to redirect those on the call um, for feedback. Um, so could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This won't take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Port Merion Group PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session, so good afternoon to you all.